Hi, this is Mike. A careful study of the aerial photographs while you're researching a river to hunt will help you avoid dangerous whitewater, sweeper-choked rivers, or those with log jams that present serious dangers to you and your hunting party. It'll also help you avoid extremely shallow rivers that will cost you days of hunting time and tons of backbreaking work. And finally, the photos could help you avoid excessively splashy rivers that will soak your game meat and force additional time-wasting meat care chores on you. Avoiding rivers like this will increase your safety margin and allow you to spend your valuable time actually hunting instead of fighting the river and your boats. Let's take a look at some aerial photos of various kinds of river characteristics so you know what to look for when you're researching an area for your Alaska float hunt. Many of Alaska's rivers present conditions that are unfavorable to float hunting. Some of these rivers offer outstanding hunting opportunities, but access is impossible, the river is too dangerous, campsite selection is very poor, the water is too shallow to float, or there are sections of whitewater that are just beyond your skill level. Some rivers offer only short sections of difficulty, while others present extensive issues, so deciding whether or not to go usually ends up as a judgment call on your part. After close to 30 years of personal involvement in this, it's been my observation that hunters tend to overestimate their capabilities. In many cases, it all works out, but once in a while it bites them, and it bites them hard. There's really no good reason to end up in that kind of situation when all it takes to prevent it is a little research and an honest assessment of your own abilities. Let's look at a few CIRs and Google Earth images to identify the types of issues you should be concerned about when you're evaluating a river to hunt. First on our list is whitewater. Whitewater is readily seen on some Google Earth and the CIR images, but on smaller rivers you're going to need to zoom in to about 200% or so to really get the detail you need. And in some cases, the whitewater is not going to show up at all, especially with um, low quality Google Earth images. So cross-reference what you're seeing on the images with other information you have from either written or video accounts of that river. This image is a Google Earth shot and a photograph taken from the same area on a river that I've hunted many times. This should give you some idea what places like this look like on the ground. This river is rated at about a class 2. It should be doable for anybody with a moderate amount of rafting experience. We saw this image in an earlier session. It doesn't offer the clarity that you need to really see what's going on on the river. And if you're not really diligent in your research, it would be easy to gloss over this one because the Google Earth image doesn't reveal any problems at all. Anytime you're looking at a smaller river at low resolution, you run the risk of overlooking critical safety issues. Here's a CIR of the same area seen at magnification. This image clearly shows some very dangerous whitewater that's completely invisible on the Google Earth image. Here's a photo that was taken by some friends of mine at this exact same location. This is a very dangerous river. The canyon walls are too steep for portaging, there's no shoreline for lining, and the only option you have here is to run it. Take your time when you're looking at the photos, and anytime you can't clearly see what's going on in the main channel, go to the CIR images to verify. The whitewater on this river is easy to see even on a lower quality Google Earth image, but when we zoom in on it on a CIR of the same area, you get a lot more detail. This is a class 4 section that would not be runnable at all by most float hunters. Sometimes it's really hard to tell how swift or dangerous a river is just from the aerial photos, so use the terrain and the tilt functions on Google Earth to gain a better insight on the river's character. If the river flows through a narrow valley, it's probably going to be swift and possibly rocky or even really shallow. In general, a river that mostly runs in long straight stretches will have a steeper gradient with a good chance of some white water. Rivers like this are fast running and the terrain usually closes in on both sides fairly close to the river. A river like this is going to require a lot of white water skill and you can be sure that your game meat will be soaked every day, which is going to add to your meat care chores at the end of the day. 
Here we zoomed in on this whitewater section and we edited the photo a little bit to bring out a little more clarity. There are sections here where the whitewater is bank to bank and it appears that there are some steep ledge drops that could give us a lot of trouble. For most hunters, this river is completely unsuitable for hunting for a couple of reasons. First, the obvious aggressive whitewater will be a deal breaker for most people. And second, the constricted nature of the terrain makes for a very narrow river corridor with little or no moose habitat. You're probably not going to find any moose on this river at all. It might be possible to find bears on this river if it's a salmon stream. Some rivers are perfect for hunting with the exception of one bad section. This river runs mostly straight, and you can see the shadow of elevated ground on both sides of the river where the arrows are. You can also see that the river appears to be constricted in this area. The narrow channel means that this section will likely contain some whitewater, along with mid-channel boulders from the eroded bluff. This image is a screenshot from the All Trails website. It's not a very good quality image, it's the best we can get on All Trails. So let's take a look at the Google Earth image of this area. Here's the corresponding Google Earth image, and one side point I want to make here is that the All Trails website is obviously using a different version of Google Earth, and so uh, not all of these tools are going to use the same imagery. We could lighten this image up a little bit in our graphics program, but this is a low resolution image that's not going to offer us any more detail at all. Because the Google Earth image is of such poor quality, we're going to need to download the high-res uh, color infrareds for this area and really study them for whitewater and other obstacles in the channel. Now here's the color infrared for this area, and right away we can see that the image is going to need some work before we can really see what's going on. To begin with, the image is both upside down and flipped around sideways, and you're going to get that with some of the Google Earth or some of the uh, CIRs. You're going to need to manipulate them. Notice the lake in the inset, which shows both the configuration of the river course and the unique shape of the lake on the inside bend. We know that the Google Earth images correctly show the orientation of the land with north at the top, so we're going to have to reverse this CIR in order to get it to display properly. Alright, now our river is oriented correctly, but it's still fairly dark and the color needs some work, and we need to zoom in on it to get the detail. Let's open this river up in our graphics program and we'll see what we can do to get a good look at this area of the image where we're concerned. Here we've zoomed in on the image quite a bit. We've enhanced the color, brightened it up a bit, and we sharpened it with the Unsharp Mask tool in Adobe Photoshop. This is about as good as it's going to get as far as image quality. And here's what it did for us. First, and I don't know if you'll be able to see this on your screen. It depends on how large the video is on your screen and the image quality of the video. But we can see some white water right here and right here. The first section is probably doable. And from what I can see on my monitor, I can identify three or four white objects in the main channel next to that arrow on the right. These are probably mid-channel boulders, and we know that for a couple of reasons. First, they're not trees because the river's too narrow and swift in this area for trees not to wash out of here. So if a tree did fall in there, it's going to scoot right downstream. Additionally, you don't see any trees along the river anyway. Um, the pebbly texture of the red portions of the image are alders, and we'll describe this in the next session when we talk about wildlife habitat. We're not going to have any trees in here. Uh, the second reason why those are probably mid-channel boulders is because we've got some steep canyon walls here, and what will happen is the river will erode those canyon walls and boulders will roll down off and into the river. So we're probably looking at mid-channel boulders here. Uh, that's, that's a pretty safe bet. At any rate, it appears that we've got enough room around these little uh, portions of whitewater here where these boulders are that we could probably negotiate our way around that. What I'm concerned about is that area where the second arrow is. That's the real problem. You've got two white streaks just downriver there, and these appear in mid-channel also. And if you look closely, they take up the entire main channel with some white water apparent even on both sides of these white areas. What we're looking at here are a pair of serious ledge drops and the tail outs of each one, basically a couple of waterfalls. This is the Cocktooley River over in Game Management Unit 17B, and if you research that river, you'll discover that the upper canyon has a Class 3 to 4 falls section. 
The reason why I went to the trouble of showing you all these images and even went to the CIR and manipulated that image to show you the detail on a river that we can readily read about in a guidebook is to show you one simple thing. This is a very dangerous section of whitewater that's completely invisible on Google Earth. If you're researching a river that you know nothing about, there are no print or DVD resources available, and you can't find anybody who knows that river well, you're going to need to download the CIRs and even enhance them to pull out all the details. It's a matter of your personal safety, and it could be a matter of your life. Now, rivers that meander back and forth like this one usually have little or no whitewater at all, and they can offer great moose hunting prospects because of the heavy deciduous growth in the riparian zone. That's the area near the river. On the negative side, the current is usually slow, and it'll take you a long time to descend this river. In some cases, even rivers like this can have a short canyon section or some steep ledge drops. So be sure to look the entire river over very carefully for hidden hazards. One of the rivers we looked at a few slides ago is a great example. The upper end looks just like this, and it offers fantastic moose hunting. But just a few miles downstream, it turns into a foaming cataract of whitewater roaring between narrow canyon walls with no room to maneuver. Rivers with streaks of whitewater like this are usually manageable by anybody with a moderate level of river experience. These streaks are usually caused by uprooted trees lying in the main channel, and most of these trouble spots are easily avoided. The reason why we know these are trees instead of boulders is because we've got a lot of heavy vegetation growing on both banks of the river with some large cottonwoods and spruce. And we'll identify this in more detail in the next session so you know how to, how to tell the vegetation types from what we're looking at here. On the other hand, uprooted trees lying in the middle of a narrow channel can spell disaster if you fail to anticipate them and fail to take corrective action in time. We'll go into this later when we discuss river navigation, but you'll want to scout these areas out on foot to figure out the best channel to take, especially if you can't easily see all the way through the channel before you commit to floating it. Determining water levels with aerial photography is a real challenge. To begin with, if you're using Google Earth, you have no way of knowing when the images were taken. But if you're looking at CIR images, in most cases they were taken during the fall when the water levels are usually low. But water levels fluctuate widely on some rivers, so regardless of what you're seeing on aerial photographs, you can count on it being different when you get there. Cross-reference what you see on the photographs with what you see in the river guidebooks in order to figure out whether that river is usually shallow or usually not shallow. Shallow water is the curse of Alaska float hunting, and if you run into it, you're going to have a lot of work ahead of you. Water levels are often at their lowest of the entire year during the fall hunting season because the snow has melted off and freezing conditions in the mountains will completely stop glacial melt. Dealing with shallow water is really hard work because it almost always means you're going to be in and out of the boat constantly, dragging, lining, or even portaging. Boat dragging can be dangerous if you step into a deep hole or slip on mossy rocks and the boat will run right over the top of you. It's also really noisy and it'll drive game away from the river. And it will eat days out of your hunting schedule. Your best bet is to avoid it completely. Shallow water is not always easily seen on either Google Earth or CIR images. On clear water streams, you can sometimes see shallow gravel bars or broken water at the tail out areas like you can in the image on the right. But on glacial or turbid rivers, you can't see two inches beneath the surface. You're going to have to look for tail out areas where the water could be shallow. Shallow water is really common on rivers like this one with lots of gravel bars and channel splits. Zoom in on the wide areas just before the channel splits or where they come back together. These are the kind of places where water might be an inch or less deep. This river is really hard to read on this Google Earth image because of the sheen on the water. So let's drag it over into a graphics program and see if we can bring out some of the detail that we need. All right, we still have a sheen on the water, but by bumping up the contrast and the sharpness a little bit, the river's a lot more readable. This is a classic shallow water river with many braids that start out shallow or either or end up that way. 
When you're looking at the aerial photos, you'll want to examine these areas with your river navigation in mind. Now, in this image, the river is flowing from right to left. That means as you drift downstream, your bow will be pointed downriver, and you'll be traveling from right to left in the photo. Facing downstream allows you to control the boat while you watch for obstacles as you approach them, and we'll get into that when we talk about navigation later on. By the way, as you're facing downstream, everything on your right is referred to as river right, and everything on your left is referred to as river left. It's helpful to know these terms because it prevents confusion between you and your passengers as you float the river. If you just use the term right and left, your passenger's facing you as you're talking, and he's not going to know whether you're talking about his right or your right. So use the terms river right and river left to indicate the right and left sides of the river as you're facing downstream. We'll talk about that more when we discuss river navigation. Now this photo starts out in the middle of a channel split. You'll want to avoid the channel on river left because it's really narrow. And also because it shallows out a lot at the end. The water here is going to be an inch or less deep, and you can see that some of the riverbed is even exposed here. So you'll want to be in this channel, but notice the shallow horseshoe-shaped gravel bar right here at the point of the arrow. If you stay to the right to avoid the shallows, You'll end up here in really shallow, narrow channel, and you probably can't float through there. In this case, you'll want to run along the downstream edge of that shallow, horseshoe-shaped gravel bar that we looked at earlier, and then cut over into this channel. But you're going to have some dragging to do at the tail out end because it shallows out into a gravel bar. That puts you back out in the main flow, heading into the deep pool before the next split downstream. And now you've got another decision to make. If you go to river right, which looks to have nearly the same flow as the left channel, you run into several shallow spots where you may have to drag. But if you take the channel on river left, you run into really shallow water at the tail out before you rejoin the rest of the river. On shallow braided rivers, you'll be dealing with choices like this all day long. Sometimes you'll make a bad move and it'll cost you a lot of extra work and sometimes you'll call it correctly and your reward will be a few more minutes of floating until the next channel split. It's a common misconception that you'll always choose the channel with the most water in it, but this can get you into a lot of trouble because some larger channels might break up into several shallow and unrunnable channels, losing some of their flow to the smaller channel farther downstream. So you'll usually walk these channels out to verify what's going on before you commit to a channel. If your river looks like this on Google Earth, there's a good chance you'll be doing a lot of dragging and fighting with the river instead of hunting. If it's a good hunting area and you have enough time to do that, fine. But 20 or 30 miles of this will eat up at least half of a 10-day hunt just dealing with the river itself. Rivers like this with intermittent shallow areas are much easier to deal with. The section in the middle of this photo appears to be a fairly new channel with a lot of down timber that's hung up in shallow water. Here there's an obvious better choice by taking the clear channel on river left. But you'll want to scan this river downstream a bit just to see what the channel does before it rejoins the rest of the river. Scan the right hand channel downstream to see if any of those trees may have broken loose over the years and possibly caused a log jam in that narrow channel. Some channels are so narrow that your oars are going to be touching each bank if you're not careful. You need to know the reach of your oars on the boats you're going to be using. If all you know is the overall length of the oars, you can guesstimate, as in most cases your boat will be rigged so the oar handles are a foot or so apart when both oars are out of the water. Multiply the length of the oars and the blades by two, and then add a foot to calculate the distance between the oar handles, and that will help you figure out your overall reach. Obviously, you need additional space beyond your oar blades, or you're going to be hitting the banks constantly. If you have a minimum of six feet, past the end of your blades on each side, you should be okay. For example, if you're running 10-foot oar shafts and the blades are 2 feet long, the river will need to be at least 37 feet wide, 12 feet for each oar, a foot between the two oar handles, and 6 feet beyond the end of the blades for clearance. Narrow rivers are ideally suited for inflatable canoes and kayaks, but you will of course have to deal with the limitations of those boats. 
We'll talk about that in our unit on boats and accessories later on. But the canoe can run some of those really narrow rivers that a cataract or a full-size round boat might have trouble with. The best way to know which type of boat will actually work is to measure the width of the channel on Google Earth, assuming you have good coverage of that area. The measuring tool on Google Earth can be set for feet and even for inches. Be sure to sample the width of the river in numerous places if there is any question at all. You can handle some short sections of narrow channels with conventional boats by shipping your oars and just lining it through. But you don't want to be fighting the river the whole way or you're going to lose a lot of hunting time and you're going to scare game away with all that racket you're going to make. Of course, if you're using an inflatable canoe, kayak, or pack raft, or a narrower paddle raft that are rigged with paddles, you're only limited by the width of the boat plus a little room on each side to paddle. The decision of whether to run paddles or oars on your canoe is influenced by the length of the trip, the loads you plan to carry, and the character of the river. Oars give you much better control of the boat on faster water with a heavy load, making an oar setup the better choice for longer floats for the most part. From a practical perspective, paddles are only necessary on rivers without enough width to allow the reach of oars. And because paddles are much less efficient for propulsion than are oars, you'll want to stick to shorter rivers if you're paddling, especially with heavy loads on Class 1 water. This section of river winds back and forth on itself a lot and shows no evidence of whitewater. This is a slow Class 1 river with a lot of down timber, as you can see. Some of the trees completely bridge the channel. On rivers like this, you may need to do some chainsaw work. We'll get to that in a minute, but for now we want to look at the channel width in order to see what kind of boat will work here. I measured the channel width in several places on Google Earth, focusing on the places that are narrowed by sandbars, and the width varies from 30 feet down to 19 feet if we don't count the sweepers that are in the way. There are ways of dealing with those on the river. But if we're running a typical rowing setup on an inflatable canoe, we're going to have a 16-foot reach from oar tip to oar tip. As I mentioned earlier, we're going to want a little extra reach to get those blades deep enough in the water to move the boat. So figure at least a couple of extra feet on each side, so let's call it a 20-foot reach for comfort from oar tip to oar tip. That's pretty close to the average width of this little river. So based on our initial measurements, it's marginally doable in an inflatable canoe with a rowing setup. It should be no problem at all for a paddle setup, but it'll be a lot of work dealing with those sweepers either way. As we've seen, some rivers have sections where the channel splits into several smaller channels that may not come back together for several miles. Braided sections like this pose challenges in the field because one channel will usually carry more water than others, but that main channel is not always obvious. Some channels start off okay, but they soon flatten out to very shallow areas where you can't float. Other areas don't look like much at the top end, but they turn out to carry most of the water as other braids join back in to increase the flow. Other rivers have channels that split off and don't come back to the main river for many, many miles. Some braided sections require scouting on foot once you're in the field in order to avoid time-wasting and physically challenging mistakes. Go down the wrong channel, and you're going to be dragging your boats, in some cases back up river even, or portaging. So whether you're scouting on foot or retracing your steps back to a channel split because of a mistake, you're wasting a lot of valuable hunting time and energy. Do your scouting from the aerial photos first. Look each channel over carefully, examining the overall width, shallow water, and other obstacles that could cause trouble for you later. This river has a channel split at the bottom of the photo that doesn't come back together for well over a mile up there at the top of the picture. Scouting this area on foot is going to be a lot of bushwhacking, especially that right-hand channel. But Google Earth can give us a rough idea of what's going on with these two channels if we just zoom in. In this enlarged inset of the channel split itself, it appears that the larger flow runs to river right. But as we look farther down the channel, there appear to be very few gravel bars. This channel is mostly straight compared to the one on river left. Remember what we said about straight channels? Faster current, no room to move. We can see a few trees lying in the water here, and we can also see some down here as well. 
So the fact that we've got a lot of, or we have no gravel bars and we have a lot of timber in the water right to the banks of the river indicate that this might be a fairly new channel. And those kind of channels can be extremely dangerous. So the river looks like it's punched a new channel through the trees fairly recently. It may or may not become a main channel eventually, but for now the river's going to continue eroding the banks, washing trees and shoreline vegetation into the channel, and creating very hazardous blockages for us. Our best bet is to take the other channel on river left because it's the main established channel. It's been there a lot longer and it's mostly clear of debris. Braided rivers that flow over mostly flat country can be the hardest kind to match up to a color infrared because the channels frequently change and they may not even be recognizable as the same area on a color infrared when you're trying to compare that with a Google Earth image. You may need to orient yourself off of nearby hills or lakes in order to identify the location in question. Rivers like this one change just about every flood cycle. So in the end, the safest course, regardless of what you read in the river guidebooks or what you're seeing on Google Earth, is to fly that area and make sure you know exactly what you're getting. If you're not 100% certain of what the river does around the next corner when you're in the field, you're going to have to park the boat and walk it out before committing to a certain channel. Otherwise, you could run out of water and cause yourself a lot of extra work. All right, let's talk about wood in the river. And it's a very common thing on a lot of rivers here. Many of Alaska's rivers flow through timbered country where a common hazard for float hunters involves trees and brush that's fallen into the river, creating various kinds of navigational hazards. Some of these hazards are extremely dangerous and can overturn rafts, throwing passengers and gear into icy water where they can become trapped underwater by the limbs and pinned against them by the hydraulic action of the river. Many of the trees in Alaska have very shallow root systems, especially the black spruce trees like the one in this picture. These are very common all over Alaska, and as the river impacts the outside of the bend, it scours the soil from under the tree roots, causing the trees to tilt over in the water farther and farther each year until there's no longer enough soil under the root system to support the tree and it falls into the river. A tree that has tilted over far enough that has its branches almost touching the water is called a sweeper, and those with branches in the water, especially way down in the water, are called strainers. The former because they can sweep everything off your boat, and the latter because your boat can be trapped on the upstream, size, up, upstream side, capsized, and the contents, including the passengers, will be strained through the branches. In shallower water, strainer limbs are sometimes embedded in the riverbed, making it impossible to swim under the limbs. This is why common wisdom concerning strainers is to climb up onto the tree and work out a plan from there. Sweepers and strainers are easily spotted on both kinds of aerial photography and can even be measured on Google Earth if you like. On rivers with narrow channels, it might be possible to slide your boat around the end of a sweeper or just under it if there's enough clearance between the branches and the water, and I've done that many times. Sweepers and strainers usually develop along the outside of a bend because that's where the main current scours the bank out. This makes them especially dangerous as the prevailing current can carry your boat right into them if you're not paying attention. Some sweepers and strainers appear around blind corners, making them extremely hazardous as you have nowhere to go but right through them. Note the location of these hazards and mark them down on your maps in advance when you're doing your research. Depending on the width of the channel, sweepers may even block the entire channel, making it necessary to pull over and either portage around it or remove it with a saw or an axe. When a tree falls completely into the river, the current tends to sweep the top of it downstream with the current pushing on the mostly flat surface of the root mat, scouring the whole or scooting the whole thing downstream until it comes to rest somewhere. The resulting mat of roots or root wad can form a serious navigational hazard if you get trapped up against it. Root wads are especially dangerous because they often lie in the main channel and can even block the channel completely. The root wad on a black spruce may stand 10 feet on the upstream side, but the root ball on a large cottonwood can be twice that height. Root wads tend to collect other woody debris and even entire trees during flooding and can become the foundation for a log jam that blocks the whole river. 
Log jams can trap boats and passengers very quickly because of the tremendous hydraulic pressure. This jam pinned a 14-foot drift boat on the bottom of the river, a 16-foot cataract on top of that, and a small pontoon raft in the middle of the whole thing. Fortunately, all the passengers survived by climbing out on top of the jam and ashore, but it was several days before the boats and gear could be recovered. Log jams vary in size and can be extremely hazardous. Be sure to note any jams on the river, including those with a channel that may allow you to float by unhindered. Note that areas with a lot of sweepers could become a problem once those trees end up in the river, so look downstream very carefully for sharp bends in the river where a jam could form. Now let's talk about water clarity for a little bit. It doesn't sound like a hazard, but there are definitely some issues with that. Alaska's rivers, like all rivers, originate from a variety of sources. Some are born of snow and ice melt from previous winters, while others emerge from glaciers in the mountains. Both types are augmented by runoff from rainfall. Rivers that flow through wooded areas may carry a heavy load of tannin leached out from the surrounding forest and staining the water a deep brown or tea color. There's really nothing of significance directly associated with these tea-colored rivers in terms of safety or navigability. I'm only mentioning it because you're going to run across them on Google Earth and you might wonder what it is. As a side note, it's been documented that plants will develop tannin in higher quantities as a protection against over-browsing by moose and caribou in parts of Alaska. This was documented by the Department of Fish and Game back in uh, the Nelchina Basin in Unit 13 a number of years ago. But just because you see a tannin-stained river, don't assume that the area is over-browsed. Tannin deposits are very common in Alaska. On the other hand, glacial rivers can present some real hazards. Glacial rivers emerge from glacial meltwater in the mountains, and they carry a heavy load of powdered rock that remains in suspension all the way to the ocean in some cases. The color of the water varies from concrete gray to powder blue depending on the type and density of the silt particles the river carries. There are three main concerns with glacial rivers. First, the opacity of the water makes it impossible to spot rocks and gravel bars that are just under the surface. This increases your chances of grounding and of course hitting a mid-channel boulder can cause all kinds of problems with the boat including capsizing. Second, the water temperature is generally cool than runoff, cooler than the runoff stream so if you lose somebody over the side, prospects for cold water shock are really high. And third, if somebody ends up taking an unplanned swim, the shock of the cold water combined with silt penetration into their clothing can cause somebody to sink pretty rapidly if they're not wearing a life jacket. Glacial rivers can be very dangerous. Glacial rivers on a CIR can range in color from concrete gray like this one to powder blue like this one and all sorts of shades in between. There's a scientific explanation of why the rivers are different colors and it revolves around the shape and density of the powdered rock fragments that are being borne along by the current combined with uh, UV filtration of the uh, sun's rays down into the water. All right, the next thing we want to talk about is off ice. Off ice is ice that's developed over the previous winter and it's persisted all summer and into the fall. By spring, it can be as much as 10 or 12 feet thick. In most years, it's gone by the fall hunting season. It's found in the high Arctic predominantly, basically on rivers that drain north out of the Brooks Range and into the Beaufort Sea. It's unlikely that you're going to find off ice south of the Brooks Range. In most years, all the ice and snow will be gone by the time hunting season rolls around, but you can see ice or snow on some of the Google Earth images. And that's because some Google Earth images were taken earlier in the year before ice melted off or even during the winter. The CIRs were taken in late summer in most cases, and some of those images do show some off-ice. Now, why would a Google Earth image show no off-ice, but you find a CIR, you find it on a CIR of the same area? The answer lies in long temperature cycle trends in Alaska. In the 1980s, when the um, uh, CIRs were shot, uh, the wintertime temperatures in northern Alaska were cooler than they were after the turn of the century. Google Earth images taken after this warming trend do not show nearly as much true off-ice. 
All the same, you're going to want to double check with your transporter on the possibility of off ice during your trip. If they're not sure, fly the route before you're dropped off. Off ice can be very dangerous. Large pieces can calve off, and if you're nearby, you could be injured. Also, the current can carry you under the ice, trapping you downstream where you can't get out. In some places, it could block the entire river channel, forcing a long portage around it. By the way, we've used this term portage a whole bunch of times. What does that mean? I'm glad you asked. It's a French word which, loosely translated, means this. Needless to say, portaging is a lot of work, and if you're basically lazy like I am, you want to avoid it, if at all possible. So, take a look at the river ahead of time, scan it for off-ice, see if that's going to be an issue. It's probably not going to be a problem, but there are occasions where you might have an issue with it, and you'll want to talk to your air charter about it. If in doubt at all, just like with everything else, fly the river before you're dropped off. Okay, so what have we learned in this session? Well, the main lesson was to learn how to identify river characteristics from high altitude, Google Earth, and color infrared images. So hopefully by now you'll have at least a basic understanding of how to identify whitewater, shallow sections that may give you trouble or cause significant delays in the field, and the various wood-related issues like sweepers, strainers, and log jams. We also looked at braided sections and discussed the importance of scouting these areas out with the photos and in the field to save yourself a lot of wasted time and possible danger. You should also know how to measure channel width, otherwise you're, going to be, uh, you're not going to know whether or not that particular river is appropriate for the boats that you want to use. We've also discussed water clarity and the causes and hazards of turbidity. We wrapped up this session with a discussion of the dangers of off-ice should you encounter it in the field. Now in the next session, we're going to sharpen our perspective on aerial photography with a look at how to identify the prime hunting areas on a river without ever having to leave your chair. That's a pretty bold claim, but yes, it is possible. You can identify prime areas without ever being in the field. My hunters and I have been doing it successfully for many, many years.